today's video, we're going to wrap up our series on solutions by talking about an important lab procedure called titration. Titration really isn't anything new, but it's a combination of things that we've learned in the past, like stoichiometry, for one thing, and the definition of molarity, what it means for something to have a certain molarity. This is used in a kind of analysis in labs called volumetric analysis. Volume, of course, means volume, and metra always means measure. So this is a technique of analyzing by measuring volume. That's what titration is. So you can imagine some tool that's measuring volume will be needed here. That tool is called a burette. A burette is a long graduated tube that's designed not to contain a certain amount, but to deliver known volumes. If you look at this drawing of the burette, you'll notice a few important features. One is that the numbers start out at the top at zero. So it's just as it's intended to do. It doesn't measure how much is contained. It measures how much goes out the bottom. At the bottom is a valve. It's called a stopcock. When the valve is open, of course, liquid can drain out the bottom, out the tip. And as you drain more and more out, the numbers get larger and larger, and so you can measure how much you have delivered out the bottom. That's what it's for. In a titration, the standard solution is a solution whose concentration you know. So you have to have one of the reactants dissolved in water to a concentration that you know. The titrant is the solution that's delivered from the burette. Often the titrant is the standard solution, but it doesn't have to be. In a titration, the goal is to reach the end point accurately. And the end point is the point in a titration where some Q, which could come from an instrument like a pH meter, for example, if you're doing an acid base titration, or it could be a color change, which is also quite common. When some Q indicates that the reaction has just completed, you've run out of your limiting reactants, and then you're about to add more, and you want to stop at that point. So there will be a visual Q or an instrumental Q that will indicate the reaction has just completed. So let's take a look at how a titration works. In this example, we're going to start with a standard solution in the burette. So the burette is clamped into a stand, and our standard solution, which looks purple in this color, is now in the burette. Now, technically, if we were going to do this titration, we would want to make sure that we had opened the valve and drained some of the purple stuff down in this region to make sure there were no air bubbles and that the tip was full. So we want the tip to be full when we start draining and full after we're done draining so that we accurately measure the amount that we've delivered out of the burette. The next thing that happens is a sample that has a known volume but an unknown concentration is put in a flask below the burette. So in this flask down here, we have the other reactant. We know its volume, but its concentration, we don't know what molarity. This, we know molarity. Then the next thing that happens is you add titrant, open the valve, and add titrant until the end point is reached. And in the picture here, you can see the valve is open, the tip is full, and now drops of the purple solution are dropping from the burette into the flask. As this continues, you watch for a visual cue that indicates the reaction is completed. And there you see the visual cue. It changed from a pale yellow to a, a pink. That's our color change indication that the endpoint has been reached. Once you reach that endpoint, then you measure the volume of titrant that was delivered to reach the endpoint by looking at the difference between the starting reading on your burette and the ending reading on your burette. That's a change in volume. The amount was delivered. And then you're going to record that to use it in calculations later. And the last thing that happens is you use stoichiometry to make calculations that determine the concentration of the unknown. Now, titration is best learned by example, so we're going to look at two examples the first one's going to be an acid-base titration, and the second one's going to be a redox titration, but the basic idea is still the same. It's stoichiometry, it's a balanced chemical equation, and it's the definition of molarity that will answer the question. So here's our acid-base titration. 15 milliliters of H2SO4 is titrated with a 0.147 molar NaOH solution. When the endpoint was reached, you have delivered 36.42 milliliters of the NaOH solution into the acid, and the task here is to figure out what is the concentration of the H2SO4. So let's go to another workspace and set this up, and then we'll solve this problem. Well, let's set this calculation up. What was in the burette here was 0.147 molar NaOH. 
And we know that the volume of that that got, got delivered was 36.42 milliliters. What was down in the flask was H2SO4. We know that the volume was 15.00 milliliters, but we do not know what the concentration was, and that's our job to determine that. In any titration problem, you need a balanced chemical equation. If you don't have a balanced chemical equation, then that's probably the objective of the titration to determine what the stoichiometry is. Here, we do know what's reacting. H2SO4 is in the flask, and it's reacting with NaOH, which is in the burette. Well, this is an acid-base reaction, so water and a salt will be our products. HOH is how I'm going to model water, and the salt will be the sodium from the sodium hydroxide with the sulfate from the H2SO4. Sulfate is 2 minus, so the correct formula is Na2SO4. Now, if I balance this, I have two H's, so I need a 2 in front of my HOH, and that needs, means I need two OH's, so I'll put a 2 in front of the NaOH, and that balances the sodium. So there's my balanced chemical equation. My starting point for my stoichiometry calculation here is I'm going to figure out from the number of milliliters of NaOH solution delivered, what is the number of moles of H2SO4 that's in the flask? Because if I can figure out the moles of NaOH, I know the stoichiometry, which will allow me to calculate the number of moles of H2SO4. I can figure out moles because I know what the definition of molarity says. So starting out here, I'm going to go 36.42 milliliters of solution were delivered. But I know that solution had 0.147 moles of NaOH in every liter, or in other words, in every 1,000 milliliters. And I chose 1,000 milliliters here so that I can get milliliters to cancel. Now I know the number of moles of NaOH that came out of my burette and went into my flask. Now here's where we can do some stoichiometry. I know from my balanced chemical equation that every time I react two moles of NaOH, I'm reacting one mole of H2SO4 from the balanced chemical equation. So now I've converted moles of NaOH into moles of H2SO4. I'm going to stop there because that's really what I want to know, how many moles are in every liter. When I do this calculation, I get 0 .00268 moles of H2SO4 must have been in the flask. So our objective is to find out the molarity. And we know that molarity is number of moles divided by liters of solution. So in this case, that means 0 .00268 moles of H2SO4 were in 15 milliliters. Well, in liters, I would have to divide by 1,000, and that would be 0 0.01500 liters. My unit then is moles per liter, or molarity. I should have three sig figs in my answer, and 0.178 molar is the answer. In this titration, we're taking all the iron in a 2-gram sample of ore and dissolving it in an acid and converting it to Fe2+. So an ore is just something that contains a metal, but, but that's not all. So we can think of the ore as... Fe, part of it is Fe, and the rest of it is other stuff. We want to know what percent of this rock is Fe. So we dissolve it in acid. We convert it all to Fe2+. The Fe2+, is titrated with permanganate ion. We know the molarity, 0 0.100 molar. The titration requires 27.45 milliliters of that permanganate solution, and we want to know what percent of the ore was iron. That's our objective. Well, if we can find out the moles of iron that were in there by titration and then stoichiometry, we can figure out the grams of iron that were there, and then we'll divide it by the total mass of the ore and turn it into a percent. Here's a hint. They give us the unbalanced net ionic equation for the redox reaction that occurs, so we'll have to balance that. Well, let's set up what's in our burette and what's in our flask. In the burette is our KMNO4 solution. So we know that it's 0 0.1000 molar KMNO4 solution. And it's appropriate that it's purple here because that is the color of KMNO4. We also know that it required 27.45 milliliters of this solution to react with the stuff in the flask. So what's in the flask? Well, in the flask we have 
FE2+. plus, But we don't know how much, and that's our objective. We have to figure out how many moles of FE2+, plus were in there to react with this 27.45 milliliters of KMnO4. We will need a balanced chemical equation to figure this out. So let's first work on getting a balanced chemical equation. We know that the oxidation half reaction is Fe2 plus becoming Fe3 plus, and we have to make the charge balance. So 2 plus on the left, 3 plus on the right. We need more negative charge on the right, so we put one electron there. Hopefully you recall how to balance redox reactions from earlier in the year. The other half reaction is going to be more complicated. It's actually the MnO4 minus that's reacting, and it tells us that it's going to reduce to Mn2 plus. That was the hint that was given to us. Well, manganese is already balanced. We have oxygen that we have to balance, however. We balance oxygen with water. So I'll need four waters to balance my four oxygens. That gives me four times two, or eight H's on the right. So I balance H with H plus. So on the left, I put eight H pluses. Now the matter is all balanced, and I just have to worry about charge. I have eight pluses on the left and one minus, so that gives me seven plus. On the right-hand side, I have only two plus, so I need five more negatives on the left. So I'll add my five electrons. And that's what happens in reduction, is you add electrons. Well, when I sum this up to get my overall reaction, I can't just add these together because I'm losing fewer electrons than I'm gaining. So I have to multiply the top reaction by five to make sure there are five electrons gained and lost. So here's the overall reaction. 8H plus plus MnO4 one minus plus five Fe2 plus makes five Fe3 plus plus Mn2 plus plus four water. That's the overall reaction here. Now I'm ready to do my stoichiometry. One thing that's important to note is that KMnO4, because it's a group one salt, will split up completely to give K pluses and MnO4 one minuses. Whatever the concentration of MnO4 is, that will also be the concentration of KMnO4. Starting out with my volume, just like I did in the last titration calculation, 27.45 milliliters. The next thing I'm going to do is multiply by the molarity of my solution. 0 0.1000 moles of MnO4 one minus solution are in every liter, and that's 1,000 milliliters. Now my mole ratio. One mole of MnO4 one minus reacts with five moles of iron three plus or two plus, it doesn't matter. Now I want mass of iron, so I'm going to multiply by 55.847 grams per mole, which is the molar mass of iron. And it doesn't matter that this is a two plus, it's still the same molar mass because electrons really don't weigh anything. So that's equal to 0.7665 grams of iron once you do your arithmetic. So to find the answer to the question, I take that 0.7665 grams of iron I divide by 2.000 grams, which is the total mass of my ore, and then I multiply by 100 to make it a percentage. When I do that arithmetic, I get 38.33%. So that's how you can do titration calculations. And with a little practice from some practice problems, you'll get quite good at this and be able to solve all kinds of problems. Hopefully, you'll also get a chance to do this hands-on in a laboratory experiment.